Okay folks, thank you so much to everyone who's joined in. If you have joined us late, we say hello to you. Thanks to everyone who has uh, shared this morning. Uh, thank you for your help in the service this morning. We have a limited time, so I want to get into the Word of God. I want to teach something that's so important. This isn't something that I find easy to speak on. I feel a bit awkward when I talk on uh, giving and all of that. In three years in Brookbury Elim, I've only ever spoken this topic once. We haven't mentioned giving during our online church. So I hope that you know our heart is that as a church, we actually um, want to give um, instead of receive. And this isn't about us trying to get more money. Nothing like that. This is about us giving you principles for you to put in your life that you may actually enter into more blessing of God. You may enter into the more peace and joy and Christ likeness and live in the way God has commanded us to live in his word. So let's read John chapter 12 verse 1 to 8 and uh, if you have a Bible get it open and uh, let's read this incredibly amazing but a uh, challenging uh, passage. John chapter 12. Then six days before the Passover Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was who had been dead whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spinkenard, anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of oil. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, said, why was this fragrance not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and he had the money box and he used to take what was put in it. But Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you have not always with you. Father, I pray your word would get entrance to our hearts and I pray that you'll give us obedience to what you are saying to us through your Holy Spirit. Challenge and instruct and encourage us, I pray. And may your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth and in our lives as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, as I've said, I've got limited time, so I want to delve right in um, and get into the Word of God this morning. Uh, you may be sitting thinking, why on earth um, did this woman give such a crazy gift? Why did she give such um, a costly thing to Jesus? Well, I think firstly, this morning, the first thing we're going to look at is... I think that this lady had a revelation of something we all need a revelation of. And we all need to get to the knowledge of this truth. All things are God's. All things belong to God. This lady is giving God, through giving Jesus, what is already his you remember last week when Garth was talking about worship? He used this phrase and I thought it was wonderful. Worship is giving God what he already deserves. And giving generous gifts to God is giving to God what is already his. You see, I want you to realise this morning that at the heart of who God is, is the reality of generosity. God is a generous God. Hallelujah. And to make it easy for you to remember, remember G for God, generosity. Remember S for Satan, selfishness. Are we a generous people or are we a selfish people? Are you a generous person or are you a selfish person? Are you following the path of Jesus, the Jesus normal, which is a which is a life of generosity and giving, or are you following the life of Satan, which is a selfish life? You see, the Bible tells us in John 10, 10, 
the thief comes to kill, steal and destroy. He wants to take as many people to hell with him. But the Bible tells us in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave. Gave what? Gave us, you know, something small? No. He gave us his best. He gave us his most precious. He gave us something that was going to cost him greatly. It says that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. He didn't just give us his son, he gave us eternal life. Everlasting life. So right at the heart of who God is, is generosity. So we see that this lady, she has some sort of knowledge that everything is God's anyway. And I want to throw out the challenge that you may think that you own something. But the reality this morning is this. You don't. And one day you will leave this earth. I will leave this earth. And I'll leave everything behind. About seven years ago. Would you believe it? I was, I was 23, 24. And I allowed money to get a grip of my life. I was just about to get married. And would you... It's, this sounds crazy, but I, I want to be open and honest with you. I'm on a journey with this stuff as well. I remember I, that money got such a grip of my life that every lunchtime, I used to go from my workplace, which was very close to the main street of Enniskillen, and I would go up to the Nationwide to get a mini statement, literally every day, just to assess the numbers. It wasn't that I was in financial difficulty. I was due to get married and I was just so concerned about money. I was so bound by money I was afraid to even buy someone a coffee if I was out meeting them. Money had such a grip of my life until one morning I was standing in the foyer of the church and someone who is connected to the church but not a regular attender, they would have known virtually nothing about me they turn to me and they says, please don't take this wrong, but I believe that God is saying to you to stop worrying about money. Well, that hit me like a ton of bricks. And I confessed to God and I repented of that. I turned away and set the compass of my life now to just trust God. And all of a sudden I came into freedom. And so I'm saying that this morning because I'm on a journey, you're on a journey. But we all need to realise that what the, the, this thing called money that we worry about and we can allow to consume us is actually not ours anyway. That house that we think we have bought, that we have a mortgage for and it's ours. It's not. It's God's. You may say, oh, I could sell it and get money for it. That's right. But you see that money? It's God's as well. That car that you drive, it's not yours, it's God's. See, the Bible tells us clearly in Deuteronomy 10, 14. Behold to the Lord your God belong heaven and the highest heavens, the earth and all that is in it. Psalm 89, verse 11. The heavens are yours and the earth is yours and the world and all that it contains. For you have founded them. Everything is God's. So this lady, I think, is a revelation that actually everything I have anyway is God's. And so that helps us then to give. If we realise that actually it's God's anyway, we're giving him what is his. And in the Bible we see three types of giving. There's tithing, there's offerings, and there's extravagant offerings. Now, tithing, the word tithe means tenth. So basically you're giving God a tenth of your income and it should be the first fruits now i know some of you are maybe thinking oh well i'm under grace nathan tithing is under the law and so maybe you're starting to think that you know do i have to do that well let me say this grace is better than the law amen grace outweighs the law it is so much better and we are so much more blessed to be under grace than under the law so therefore, if the law required 10%, should we actually then not be more generous? 10% is actually maybe downplaying what we should be given. 
But I always say to people, that's a great starting point. Because that's actually the lowest form of giving in the Bible. Start at 10%. And don't give whenever you have everything else sorted. Give the first 10%. Give it to God. The sad reality is that on average, uh, the stats would say that Christians give 2.5% of their income to God. So they don't even get to the first part of tithing. Can I be honest? I didn't tithe till I was 25. God had to work in my heart. I was a young person and I used to look and think, oh, that's the older people's job. This is my money. I don't have a lot of money, so I need to keep it for myself. That was a lie of the enemy. And I said no to blessing in my life by withholding the act of worship by giving. See, worship is more than singing songs. It's also in what we give to God. The greatest sign um, of your faith is how you treat your resources. You can pray till the cows come home. You can sing till the cows come home. But if God doesn't really get a hold of this area of your life and you open up your life, your resources, your time, your finances, your gifts and all the resources of your life, if you don't open it up to God, You'll never see blessing in your life. You'll never see God use you. You'll never get into the place of true peace and joy. And so I just want to say a massive thank you to the older generations. They, and if you look around the church, widely speaking, it's the grey-haired people that, uh, that you rely on to give to the work of God. I want to challenge all the young people listening. And uh, I wish someone would have took me aside uh, whenever I was a young person and, and, and challenged me on it. Um, I used to watch that basket go by every week. But I want to tell you, this is an intergenerational command. This is not just for the older people. This is for all ages. To give to the Lord as an act of worship. So bring it into the house. The Lord says, test me in this. Will I not actually pour out a blessing upon you? So we want to be a generous church. We want to be generous people. And uh, I believe that you cannot outgive God and you will not be worse off by giving to God. Test God in it. He tells you to do it. And I could talk on this for a long time. I'm going to keep on going. Next we go to offerings. You might see a waiter and you just want to bless them and, and that's an offering unto God. You're doing something that's generous. Or you might see a family in need and and you just want to, as a family or as an individual, just bless that family. But I would call that offerings. And then on top of that, there's extravagant offerings. Like what this lady did. She gave something so costly, something so precious, something that meant a lot to her. I think of Solomon. Solomon was required to give one bull. But actually, he gave a thousand bulls. I'm sure people looking in thought, what a terrible business decision. He's wrecking his um you know resources he's racking his business what a terrible decision but you see the bible tells us that that very night after he gave this extravagant gift to god god came to him and said ask anything of me and i'll do it you see extravagant offerings just there is something that catches the heart of god in it so and then as well, there's something else uh, on my mind, which is actually the lady who gave in the Gospel of Luke. It says that Jesus was watching. And uh, as Jesus is watching, there's these high and mighty people and they're putting big amounts into the basket. And they're puffing themselves up and thinking, oh, look at me, I'm putting this into the, into the basket. And then comes this wee widow and she puts a little in. But the Bible says that Jesus notices what's going on and he actually says that this lady has done better because she has gave something that has truly cost her she has gave something that is actually that is in proportion she has gave more than these other men because they have gave a big amount but it is little to the amount that they have in their account that's why I don't like it when churches display people's individual incomes at the end of the year. I don't like that. This is a private thing between your heart and God. 
This should never be about what do they give so that I can give around that amount. No, no, no. This is what do you value God to be in your life? How much do you value Jesus? What is the act of worship you want to give him through your generous lifestyle in your serving of him through your time your gifts and your talents and also through your resources this lady so it is not about quantity it's about quality the quality of your heart so we've got tithes offerings and extravagant offerings and all of that will be helped and tips to help us give in those areas will be when we recognize all things belong to God Secondly, and these last two points will be quick. Um, this lady gives this extravagant gift, I believe, because of a response of what Jesus has done for her. Look at the previous chapter. John chapter 11. Mary and Martha's brother is unwell. They call for Jesus to come and heal their brother. Jesus doesn't come in their time scale and so the brother dies. Jesus now turns up when the body has been buried and proceedings of grieving and the funeral and all of that are now happening. They think Jesus has turned up too late, but Jesus has turned up at a time that is the right time, the perfect time, heaven's time. You see, Jesus actually wanted to do more for them than what they had asked. They had asked for a healing. Jesus wanted to give them a resurrection. And maybe you're in a waiting period and I just feel actually it says, I don't have it in my notes, but actually it's just coming to me right now. Somebody is waiting for something. You're asking for a healing, but God is actually something greater for you. God is a resurrection. God is going to actually give you something greater than what you're asking for right now, such as his heart of generosity. God has been hearing your cry. You may think he's turning up late. I want to speak into your life today. God is not turning up late. God is on his way and he's going to turn up at the right time. You may be led to a place of even greater desperation. You may be led to a place where you have no other things to call on but him. But he is going to show up and he is going to give a resurrection instead of a healing in that situation. Now I'm not talking literally. I'm not talking that a person's going to die. That's not what I'm talking about. But I'm just saying that he is going to give you greater than what you're even asking. Just keep trusting. Keep on praying. Keep on believing. Keep on worshipping him. He is coming. But I believe that this lady gives this extravagant gift because of what Jesus has done for her. Jesus heals their brother. His name is Lazarus. And we read now in verse 2 that Lazarus is at the dinner table with Jesus. And they're enjoying a meal together. I love this picture. Maybe Mary is looking over at that table and thinking, wow, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for what you have done for my family. You have answered our prayer and gave us beyond what we could have asked for. Our brother has been brought back from death. And so we see that possibly, I, I believe this is part of it, I, I would commend it to you as well to believe that her gratefulness leads to her generosity. A grateful heart will breed a generous heart. And so if you find in your life right now you would say I'm not that generous, I wouldn't try to go out and be generous. I would go out firstly and try to get a grateful heart Try to think about what Jesus has done for you. Are you starting to see where I'm going? Go to the verses that Sharon Slack read us, where she reminded us from the word of God that we were dead in sin, dead in our trespasses. We were spiritually dead, us who are saved. We were Lazarus in the tomb, dead, but we have been made alive through Christ. Listen to me this morning. We have been made alive so how much more should we not be thankful? Mary was thankful for a brother who was brought back to life. But here's me and you individually. Nathan Johnson was dead and Jesus called my name and I walked out of that tomb. Hallelujah. I walked out of the tomb and I've been made alive. 
So when I begin to remember the things that Jesus has done for me, that I'm saved, that I'm his son, that he's made a home for me in heaven, that his promises in the word of God are yes and amen, that he's blessed me with a home, he has blessed me with food on the table, he's blessed me with a family, he's blessed me with my children. Maybe you could say I've prayed and God has saved my children, God has saved my father, God has done this. Let that create thankfulness in your heart and that thankfulness will begin to lead the way to, to a lifestyle of generosity. This lady was thankful and it led to generosity. Lastly, we see in this story that this lady, Mary, was not just investing in the moment, she was investing in future events. And generosity has this profound way of investing into the future. Whenever you live a lifestyle of, of generosity, you will actually live a very prophetic life. There is something about future impact that a life of generosity in the, the now has. Let me put it like this. If you are to remember people in your life who has left an imprint, it's often people that were generous, not necessarily the people who preached to you or the people who stood at a distance from you. I remember people like Willie Crow, who I have more memories of than someone who preached at me. Why? Because he lived a life of generosity. He was a kind man. He was a generous man. And every Sunday, any children that came into the church at the door, he used to be giving them sweets. He just loved giving to people. And this lady, in verse 7, Jesus says, Let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. She had actually invested this here that went on this day. And come with me here. I'm not sure if she realised exactly the future events that she was sowing into. Jesus goes to the cross. There is no record that his, his body is anointed between the cross and the grave, which should have happened as was their custom. Don't have time to go into it. We read that the following day that the ladies come down to anoint his body with the spices. That doesn't happen because his body has already been anointed and it's anointed through this lady in this story. Jesus says, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. She was actually investing in the future. She was actually putting something into the hands of God and he was blessing it in such a way that I'm sure this lady did not know the repercussions of what was going on here. Praise God. Maybe you think, oh, I don't have much to give God. Well, give that little to God and he will do amazing things with it. Leave a legacy of generosity. Don't leave a legacy of stinginess. Don't leave a legacy of a life of selfishness. Leave a legacy of generosity. I am telling you now, it will have profound power, not just today, but in years to come. Invest into the future through a life of generosity in the now. When you give that waiter that tip, you may think, oh, what good could that do? I am telling you, next time you come in, they may be more open to hear the gospel through your life. Or they may, so God could just do something through it. This lady was investing in future events. And I trust that each one of us will allow our hearts to become grateful so we may be led to a life of generosity. I'm not saying to go out and be foolish. We have to be stewards, good stewards of what God has entrusted in us. The Bible says if we can't be trusted in little, he will never trust us with much in the kingdom. Judas failed the test of money. But this lady, Mary, she was precious in what she did. Do you know the word, and this is what I live with. Maybe you're thinking, ah, oh, Nathan, this, that, I'm not quite sure about it. Listen to this. In the word of God, the word believe, the word believe is used 272 times. The word pray is used 371 times. The word love is used 714 times. Now listen to this. The word give is used 2,000.
152 times. Do you get what I'm saying? Giving is important to God because he put it time and time again into this book. I trust that you'll be blessed. I trust that you will be a blessing to your community, to our church, and to those around you. Keep on asking God to give you a heart of thankfulness. Remind yourself of what he has done and allow that thankfulness to lead to a life of generosity. Oh,